quite across and says stop, he'll heat and melt the street. Charges Cross and Govan Cross, where all the people meet. West Street, Shields Road, the train goes round and round. You've never lived unless you've been on the Glasgow Underground. On the Glasgow Underground. I wrote that song because, to me, as to other Glaswegians, there's something very special about our little underground railway. For over 80 years, the little trains have trundled round the six and a half mile track, and it seemed as if they would go on forever. Now, suddenly, this weekend, it's all over. And in time, something new and shiny and utterly modern will take its place. I wonder if anyone will want to write a song about that. The end of the old Glasgow subway has saddened not only Glaswegians, but enthusiasts from all parts of the country. There is, without doubt, nothing quite like it anywhere else. To an East Coaster like myself, living in that other city, Edinburgh, the underground's attractions are not entirely obvious. I mean, if you simply want to take a look at a surviving relic of Victorian Glasgow, fair enough. There's plenty here to marvel at, not least the fact that the trains haven't yet rattled themselves to bits. But if you simply want to take a trip, for example, from Hillhead to Buchanan Street in order to catch the last train back to Edinburgh, you need to be a little masochistic to want to actually pay to travel in these toy town torture chambers. Even the most extreme Glasgow folk might have second thoughts about subjecting himself to the sounds, the smells, and the shooglings of the Glasgow underground. Years of neglect took their toll. The little red trains carried fewer and fewer passengers round the six and a half mile circle. Even so, they had a charm of their own. <laughs> you lost? <laughs> <laughs> <She's all> <laughs> <She's> <laughs> I thought this, there you go. <laughs> I thought we were the only ones that was lost. <laughs> You've got about a flat there. <laughs> You didn't need to be a Glaswegian to take a pride in the underground, the only one in Britain outside London. Just look for a moment beneath the surface grime and its wrinkled, peeling face, and you can easily sense its former glory as a showpiece of Victorian endeavor. Opening day, the 14th of December, 1896. The people of Glasgow thronged in their thousands to give the underground a welcome usually reserved for visiting royalty. But the day of triumph ended in tragedy when one train crashed into the rear of another underneath the Clyde. 18 people were injured and the underground was shut down for almost a month. Since then, the underground has given over 80 years faithful service, with some of the original coaches remaining in service after rattling around for more than five million miles. What's the attraction of the underground? To someone like myself from Edinburgh, it seems like a dirty, smelly place. Uh, well, possibly uh, Glaswegians enjoy dirty, smelly places because we are used to them anyway, but to us it's not a dirty, smelly thing. Yes, it's not all that glamorous, but for one thing, in, in symbolic terms, every Glaswegian has Christmas every day because he owns his own Hornby train set. You know, it's the biggest train set in the world. And, and people with, uh, from other cities like Paris and Moscow and London and New York come here and adore this because it really is the toy railway. It's the railway of dreams. We came from Rugby today on the special excursion but we came back from the Isle of Man the day before, the special so we could go on it. If you look at the stock, you can see it's to an old design, and I think it is a real tribute to the carriage builders of 70 and 80 years ago that such stock can still be used today. From the enthusiast point of view, it's a shame to see such things go.
a group of workers from that other underground in London are among those paying their last respects. Why have they joined the pilgrimage? To say farewell, really, while we've got the opportunity to. Why would you want to say farewell to a subway? Well, to get some photographs of it, uh, to compare it with our own, because it's completely different in atmosphere, as a record, more or less. What is the attraction of the Glasgow subway to someone like yourself? I think the, the ancient rolling stock, the friendliness of the staff, which tends to contrast a bit with London. Just how different is the subway? <laughs> There's no comparison whatsoever. <laughs> what did you think when you were on your first trip round? Oh, goodness, no. It's a total surprise, I think. <laughs> Why? Um, I, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> That's all I can say. The underground was due to close this Sunday with a flourish. Half a million souvenir tickets had been printed for people wanting to say cheerio to the wee red trains. But cracks appeared in the station roof, and that was that. I thought I'd bring Andrew for his first and last ride on the underground before it closed next week. We were planning to go to Kelvin Hall to see the exhibition there. Um, I'm afraid Andrew's missed out because it, the system's closed down for the day, unfortunately. Do you like undergrounds? Yes. What do you like about them? Because it's dark. Do you get scared? No. No? Well, when you're going through the tunnel, you're looking for anything that's out of order, like, you know, broken rail or a, a clip out, broken bit of tea iron, things like that. You know, anything that's not supposed to be there. You get dead cats, occasional dead bird, things like that. If you find that, you're supposed to shove it out the road so the general public doesn't see it. Ghosts, like, no. Don't think about it. If you, if you do think about it, you're allowed to see something. But if you don't, you just stick to your job. Like, you don't think about things that's going to jump out of wee corners and try and frighten you. If you do think about it, you'd, you'd be walking along. At least we know you'd be... You end up looking like a ghost. There was a funny story about uh, an engineer that went down there one of the times, and uh, usually the, the, the drill is that the, the car takes them down, stops at the bottom of the hill. The uh, engineer and his mate gets off, and now there's a wooden door down there into the pump room. And uh, he got off and he said to the driver, right, we'll pick us up the next time round, which meant that they would do a complete circle, stop and the next time round and pick him up. But when he got down there, here the door had jammed. The result is he was, him and his mate were huddled in to the wee recess in the wall and the other trains were coming thundering down, you know. And he was quite glad to see the car that he'd already left do a full journey and pick him up the next time round. <laughs> What would you say to people who suggest that travelling by the subway is the best way to see Glasgow? Because you don't see uh, the bits that normally appear on television, the slums and the motorway and so on. Now, that's a very interesting idea. What you do see is the most important thing in Glasgow, Glaswegians. The subway is absolutely and richly and, and magically polluted with Glaswegians. please. Thank you. My entertainment is only pray to God, no anything else. No picture, no dance, no anywhere else, no smoking, no drinking. So uh, my entertainment, I, my enjoyment is if I no miss my prey, I am quite happy man in her life. Ticket please. Thank you. Ticket please. Thank you. You enjoy your holiday? Ticket please. Thank you. Ticket please. This ticket no belong to our train.
What do your workmates and the passengers think when they see you praying on the train? Passenger knows the passenger are knowing that. Pardon? Passenger are knowing my idea. And what do they think of it? As they are think that a good idea is man making money and same time he making his good life and future. Okay, let's go then. Oh well, there's sometimes an odd cat or a dog seems to come down and you've got to watch these things. You've got to watch it, uh, there are no obstacles in the track. Especially in the morning where the permanent way men have been out all night, they probably leave maybe a pick or a shovel, maybe because of an accident. But normally there, this doesn't happen, you know. And then there's the bad bend at Kakadans, you've got to watch you don't make your ear coupling. Under the Clyde, that's what they call a sump. You've got to watch in case maybe that's flooded. And if you see any, well, when I say flooded, maybe kind of high water. Well, if, when you see that, like, you have to report it to the next station master on the line. He contacts the station master at the rear, so every train knows to go slow at that part. Because the water comes up, it's into the motors, motors are cooked. This signalling system is, is unique in the sense that there's no other system like it in existence at the present time. And uh, of course, in two days' time, uh, this will be uh, coming come out when we take everything out of the stations after that, the closure. And, um, it's a unique system that I'll be very sorry to see, see go, but uh, I'll hope to retain some parts of it as a memento in the future. How difficult has it been to keep it going? Well, it has been very difficult because, uh, as you can visualise, when it was installed in 1935 and uh, over the past quite a few years now, uh, we've been finding parts irreplaceable to su in such an extent that it's been, been a case of robbing Peter to pay Paul to keep up, to keep up this part of the system going. We do cannibalise, believe you me, and uh, it takes a bit of uh, ingenuity to do this, so it does. But uh, we managed to do it one way or another. Uh, we have done it, and uh, we'll continue to do it till it, it closes. But uh, I personally will be uh, glad to see the new system uh, come into vogue in 18 months' time. The underground has been modernised once before. In 1933, cable power gave way to electricity. The two cables, each of them almost seven miles long, were scrapped. It gave the underground a new lease of life. It was very, very popular, and the uh, people thronged to see the underground being driven by electricity. And uh, it was it was a very, very good thing because it had changed over from the old cable days until the onto the power-driven uh, uh, traction engine. You know, actually, I've seen queues uh, four abreast down uh, Govan Cross down there, two policemen controlling the queues and uh, it was very popular. Of course, the fares were very, very much cheaper in these days, and it was only a half pence uh, from Govan Cross across to Merton Street, which was good value for money, because it was taking you underneath the river, and uh, it was a long way around if you didn't use the underground, so it was very, very, very much popular. Was there any time when the popularity caused problems? Uh, it was, uh, more especially so at football matches. Uh, when you left Merton Street, and for any reason at all, if you had a breakdown underneath the river, uh, the football fans weren't uh, too happy about this, and of course there was many a, an argument about it. And uh, it was a job trying to get in to do the repair, for to bring the car up. And uh, the only thing that they thought about was getting to the football match. 
Doris Cahoon, you worked in the claims department at one time. What kind of complaints did passengers make? I don't recall passengers making very many complaints at all. The only thing I really recall in any uh, that there was a lot of were people catching their hats in the trellis gates. If you're tall, the trellis gates were very well oiled for opening and shutting, and the hats used to get caught quite often. Sometimes coats get caught in those little nicky bits. You have a different approach to the public here. Up on the buses, you're in, in with the public, you're in among them all the time. Here they're on the other side of this grill, and they take advantage of it. <laughs> Say way? something rude and run down the stair. <laughs> and do you never pursue them? Oh no, you can't. You can't leave the, the window. In practical terms, of course, it's a marvellous transport system because um, it gets you around the city and then back again, or round and round again. And it's probably one of the only ways in which a north sider ever involuntarily goes through the south side. I mean, you won't see much of the south side. I know, but you can tell the difference. You get the leaks through the tunnel under the Clyde, and then you know you're in foreign parts where Arapaho Indians and Cherokees and wild patans are going to fire at the train any moment. You're in foreign parts. If deep in the south side you see any smoke signals, they're probably coming from Peter McKechnie's fish shop next door to West Street Station. I suppose in a sense you're being modernised in the same way that the subway is, because you're going to move to brand new premises as well. Oh yes, but uh, you lose a bit. Been here a long time. And with the bricks, as they say. The top, in the whole, it's. Don't know if I'll benefit. I'll need to wait and see. I hope so. We'll have a new premises, but we're losing something here that it'll not have, you know. It's quite unique. Right. Okay, give me uh, a nice thing. How's that? Nothing. Modernisation is likely to put pay to a unique form of communication between the fish shop and the staff in stations down the line. Peter was often puzzled by the fact that they always seemed to know when he was smoking fish. Believe it or not, it's even you smoke. This is true. Some smoke must drift down and he can actually see the smoke in the tunnel of his underground. Aha, uh -huh. he says, Peter smoked today. OK, thanks very much. Thank you. And that worked every time. He knew it was without fail. He said he could smell it and he could see the slight smoke in the tunnel, he says. Ah, and that went on for a long time. Elliot Simpson, a biochemist, is on the track of another smell, that unique aroma arising from deep in the bowels of the underground, that pong Glaswegians have come to love, the subway smell. Elliot, this is the first time you've actually been down in, in the tunnel. What exactly are you looking for? Well, I'm wanting to get some samples of the different types of mud, the dry mud here, and I've got wet mud from the other tunnel, and I want to take some of this back to one of my colleagues in the lab, and I, hopefully we'll be able to culture something interesting from it. How did you develop an interest in searching for the underground smell? What? Well, Saw a bit in the Glasgow Herald about the quest for this elusive whatever um, in connection with the exhibit at the Transport Museum. How did the search for the subway smell begin? Well, you know, it's one of these ridiculous things. A fellow from one of the evening papers phoned me up uh, one day and he asked if we were getting everything we wanted. And I said, uh, well, we hoped so. And he said, are you getting full cooperation from the Transport Department? I said, oh, yes, they're very helpful indeed. And he sort of pushed me a bit, you see, and he said, are you really getting absolutely everything you want? And I said, well, we're having a lot of trouble getting the smell, and, um, well, that's just how it started, you see, and uh, I almost wish I hadn't said it. The smell down here reminded me of a smell that I'd met at college at, um, from a particular culture uh, medium, and I thought, well, if only you could grow up this organism, and you could waft the smell through the exhibit, and you have your genuine underground. Can you remember what that culture was you met previously? Well, it was one of the actinomyces family. 
but uh, each one of these members has a slightly different smell. And it's probably uh, a Streptomyces. But, um, then there are several of those, and again, each one has its own smell. So it could just be a special one for the Glasgow Underground that isn't in any other. Have you got a, a favourite at the moment? Well, I've got a culture of Streptomyces, which I've been able to borrow. And um, it has this sort of damp smell that you'll get in underground caves. And yes. It's, it's uh, a bit stronger than you've got down here. but if Concentrated you, smell. It's a concentrate. Um, so you can dilute it with a lot of air, and you only need a little. Do you see a time when people might be able to buy bottles of the underground smell for those people who want to remember what it was like in the old days? I don't know whether you'd actually want to have the organism in a bottle, but I should imagine you ought to be able to separate out the, the smell in a safe form. And you never know, we may have aerosol, instant tunnel, uh, instant nostalgia. The Glasgow mother taking her child to the top of the subway stairs to sniff the air it seems to have grown in strength, the myth that the air from the subway gives healing pro has healing properties. I think it stemmed from the time when we used Archangel Tar, and that was before 1936. It was used on the rope system. But since 1936, there's been no Archangel Tar. But nevertheless, mothers have still taken their children to the top of the stairs to sniff the uh, what isn't there, really. Well, Elliot, you've taken away the samples from the tunnel and you've analysed them. Have you come up with anything? Well, I've had a sniff at most of them. Some of them I had to boil to get to get some smell coming out of them. But I think the most promising one is this one. Um, it's from the mud underneath the burn that runs through Govan Cross Station. And I think if you have a sniff of this, you'll see that it's got potential. Whew. That's, that's a, that smells pretty authentic to me. What do you think of it? Interesting. Is that a very interesting indeed? Um, I think I'd rather smell it than drink it. Does that smell to you like the authentic smell of the underground? Uh, I think that uh, it's pretty near it, but I'd like to see a little more um, oily, tarry smell perhaps injected with it. Could you mix that up with it, do you think? I think we could try. Meanwhile, up in the sheds, the ancient coaches are lifted out of the tunnels for the last time, one by one. This toy town operation will no longer be necessary in the revamped system, thanks to a new drive-in tunnel. An easier business, certainly, but not nearly so much fun. I think everybody loves the old Glasgow subway, and they come from America and Canada just to even get a sniff at the old place. I'm sure you've heard that before. That's but, how much people like it. But people like yourself who actually have to keep them going must get fed up with them, surely? No, not really, because, I mean, you meet uh, all the cuthy characters of old who used to work in the place. They're uh, continually coming in and out, see how the place is going, see how the trains are working, and see who's died and who's coming and all this sort of thing. So, I mean, there's always something to talk about. There's always something to do, you know. I will permit it to be modernised, but I don't demand it. I still enjoy it the way it is. And I only hope that the new, a trendy 1980s underground keeps some of the quaint magic that we have in this one. Like what? A, like shaking your boat like a spavined horse, for instance, and giving you the chance to look at beautiful young ladies in the seat opposite and dream dreams. It's a railroad of dreams, my boy. It's a railroad of dreams. If a latter-day Rip Van Winkle had fallen asleep in the maintenance sheds decades ago, he would find it much the same today. Perhaps the Transport Museum should preserve it as it stands. There are so many old things, um, railway stations and subway sheds and other places, that really, I, I suppose, if modernisation is to go ahead, there just isn't room to preserve everything full size as it was in the past. Modernization is already underway, but old traditions die hard. 
These coaches are being cannibalized yet again, this time to carry the brand new track into the tunnels. The new underground, estimated to cost 33 million pounds, is expected to open in 18 months. With luck, that will be a less calamitous opening than the first one. The time around the track will be reduced. Presently we take 28 minutes, half an hour. The new coaches will make the journey in 22 minutes. Now, that's quite a, an improvement. But what people will notice will be the improved ride. We have the present, what is known as the Glasgow Shugle. It's good for the kidneys, alopecia, or anything you like. But uh, unfortunately, it's not very convenient uh, if you're uh, carrying parcels or carrying children. You get thrown about a bit. Rich people spend fortunes buying horses to get the same effect on their liver as the underground gives people in Glasgow for coppers. Some people have suggested that unless the new system shugles about to the same extent, it may have problems negotiating some of the bends. <laughs> I've heard that as well. Well, we're realigning the track. Um, we have done a profile of the tunnel all the way around with a computer, and uh, we think it will fit. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and in December 78, we'll put the first one down the tunnel and see if it works. Is it really as uncertain as that? No, not really. I'm only joking. It, um, it's quite certain that it will fit and it's quite certain it will run. Can you say with any certainty that the new coaches will last 81 years? I wish I hadn't asked that question. Um, I wouldn't think they would last as well, but I'm quite certain they will meet the requirements of Glasgow for many, many years. Well, I've been down at Birmingham there, say about a month ago, and I've seen the new trains, and I think they're smashing. Well, the ovens compared to these, this is an icebox, I see. So, it's the end of the line for the wee red train and in a way for the men and women who've kept them going. Although many of them will transfer to the new underground, it'll never be quite the same. Oh, it was a sort of family affair, you know? And uh, many, many a time at uh, the line of demarcation, uh, and these days, of course, the line of demarcation is very much in evidence, but in these days, no. Uh, everybody just helped out, and that was one of the reasons why the underground was able to run as well as it has done until the present time. Well, I'm really sorry that it's closing insofar as it's a very typically Glasgow institution. The new one, I suppose, will be uh, very smart and tidy and all that sort of thing, but somehow there's something Glasgow, really Glasgow, about the subway, and I think everybody will miss it very much. <laughs>